Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Announcing Miracles We continue in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1. Last week we worked through the announcement of the coming birth of the baptizer. This week we begin with continue, the continuing work of the angel Gabriel as he brings further announcements from God. And I should begin by saying welcome Mr. Luke there with Mary in Arkansas. We appreciate you being with us this morning. So this morning we're going we're to continue our study in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 as Gabriel continues to go from God to people and make announcements. This is fascinating stuff to me, and let's see what we can figure out here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Gabriel is the same angel that we saw deliver an uh, announcement to Zechariah uh, in the temple. He was dispatched directly from the throne room to God, or from a throne room of God, to bring this message to Mary. So it's it's like God calls Gabriel, okay, I, I need a message, take this down and go deliver it. Six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, God dispatches Gabriel to bring a message to Elizabeth's relative, Mary. I'm fascinated by Gabriel and his mission. We've seen him elsewhere in Luke, but we also see him in Daniel, where Daniel records that Gabriel is the one that brings him the, the interpretation of the dream. From these passages, we know that Gabriel's job is to com communicate with people stuff from God. In Daniel, Gabriel adds Daniel in, aids da uh, Daniel in interpreting some of the dreams. Those interpretations were communications from God. I don't know what that's like. I'm not sure I really want to experience an angel coming to me. I don't know what he looked like. I don't know how he spoke. I, I don't know any of that. Uh, Harper's been watching a lot of Superbook, and in Superbook they have angels showing up. And you know they're always two. They have, they're always big, handsome guys with with wings that have power and an authoritative voice. I don't know if that's how he was. I, I just don't know. I want to know, but I don't want to see it yet. You understand my reluctance? I, <laughs> whenever we peer in behind the curtain of separation between the physical world and the spiritual world, it's kind of I don't want to use the word spooky, but I think you understand what I'm saying. It's kind of awesome. it's kind. Eerie, yeah, it's, it's alarming to me. So, but Gabriel fascinates me because of his job. How long has he been doing this? You know, it, how many times do, has he done it that we don't have recorded in Scripture as being the messenger for God? The angel Gabriel also factored very heavily into Jewish literature of the post-exile time. So as we look at other writings, not scripture, but other writings of Jews from the return from exile until the time of Jesus, we see a lot written about the angel Gabriel, including in many of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here in Luke, Gabriel's second assignment was to visit Mary in Nazareth. Luke describes Mary as a virgin. If you were to go and do a research paper on what people say, you do a survey of what authorities say about, about uh, this word virgin, you'd come up with lots of different interpretations. The ESV um, word virgin is the Greek word parathenu. The noise that I'm talking about that comes from people discussing this is about the movement to highlight 
that this word may be translated as something other than virgin. Well, that's true. It never happens in Scripture. While this is possible translation, it's not the normal use of the word as in the New Testament or in the Greek literature of the time. In Scripture, every time the word is used in Greek, both in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Greek New Testament, it means virgin. With the exception of Revelation 14.4 where it's not talking about a woman that hasn't had sexual intercourse, it's talking about men that haven't had sexual intercourse. So every place it's used in Scripture, it's talking about somebody that's not had sex. That's, that's the defining thing about Scripture. It tells us what it means, and it means virgin. The same is true of the Hebrew word used to describe in, that Chuck wrote, uh, read in uh, 714 of Isaiah. It also can be used to describe a young, marryable woman. But it's always used to describe a young, marryable woman who hasn't had sex. So it's hard to, get, to have it come become some other translation. Now why would the world want us to think that Mary wasn't a virgin when Jesus was born? Because it eliminates the miracle of, of Jesus' conception. You know, it's, it's the immaculate conception. It's not the miracle of Jesus' birth. Jesus was born just like anybody. How he was conceived is the miracle. So don't allow people to, to rewrite the use of, of words. It's important because the virgin birth, uh, birth of Jesus is a doctrine that's extremely important to our overall understanding of doctrine. Early church theologians wrote extensively on the virgin birth. In the first 200 years of the church, there was a growing group of misbelievers, that's a better way to say it, I think, the Gnostics. And they held that Jesus descended from heaven and was not born or was not truly human. What's the problem with that? Then you don't have a human sacrifice paying for your sins, and therefore we would not be saved. Then there's another group that held that Jesus was only human, not divine, and was adopted by the Father at his baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, was the adoption, according to this group. But the early church wrote extensively on this. The Council of Nicaea in 325 AD affirmed that Jesus was, was truly God. The Council in Chalcedon, Chalcedon, Chalcedon in 451, stated that Jesus was fully God and fully human, where they were the first to articulate the doctrine of the hypostatic union. That's that, that wonderful term that says Jesus was 100% God and 100% human. That's the hypostatic union, this, this impossibility that's only possible with God. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe... In Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived of by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. So here's your first question today. Why is the virgin birth so important? What makes this doctrine so important? It's in one way Jesus could have been sinless. I'm glad you said that because that's, that's a very common answer. But I think wrong. I think so. And I'll explain that. It, establishing it, his right to the throne. Establishing his right to the throne, which would have come through David, mm -hmm. which didn't need a virgin. Yeah, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he he's needed to be God, and how, how could he be God if he was born of a human man? Right. There's a whole bunch of teachings on, on the importance of the, the virgin birth. One that uh, is that it provides for the hypostatic union, the only potential union of 100% of God and 100% man. Some argue, as, as Steve pointed out, that sin is possessed by the, it was passed by the Father, and since Jesus didn't have a human father, he had no sin. I'm not sure we can establish that fact. Not the fact that he had no sin, but that sin is only passed on by the Father. Because we have no other examples where somebody didn't have a dad. 
Right? There's, there's no other examples where you have an immaculate conception. So I, I'm not sure scripture tells us that. It seems like a pretty good inference. And women like that. Women like us to say that, that sin is only passed on by the dad. Let me just say the woman is involved as well. Okay? Because nobody has ever been born without a mom. So, we, we, cannot, we can't make that argument legitimately. It feels good, but I don't, I don't know that we can make that argument legitimately. And I know I have been guilty of it myself. I think the importance of the virgin conception is that it was initiated by God to bring divine and human together. It was part of God's plan from the very beginning to have a, a solution for the sin of the world. It needed to be of enough value to cover the sins of all that were, that were called by God. And, and one human couldn't do that because we all have sin. So at best, what we are doing, if you paid for your own sin, you're making yourself at zero. You're not in the positive category, which is what's necessary to go to heaven. So at the best you could do is get to zero. You'd pay for your sins, but you would not become righteous. And so there needed to be something, someone, who was human to pay the human penalty, but was of enough value, read divine, to be able to take you from being at zero to righteous. So the virgin birth is necessary to bring the divine and the human together. Without it, I don't think it's possible in the plan God has established and shown us that we could be saved. We'll talk about, about that more as we go through the text in, in the Gospel of Luke. Verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. I can't wrap my head around how that would have worked. You know, I, I have been to places where I felt the overlap of the spiritual world and the, and the uh, um, physical world. But here was Mary, standing there face to face with the representative that came directly from the throne room of God. Was he glowing? If we take what happened to Moses where he had to wear a veil after he was being with God, maybe he was. I don't know. As I said last week, I, I don't know what he looked like. I don't know what his appearance was, but he alarmed Mary. Here's this young teenage, probably teenage girl who was now confronted with this being who said, don't be afraid. Anytime people told me, don't be afraid, I'm afraid. It's kind of like a Pavlovian response. You, you can't not be afraid, right? But she was greatly troubled at the saying, don't be afraid. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. It was not Gabriel's appearance that troubled her. But because he said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. That's what troubled her. Uh, maybe I'm a simpleton, but I think his appearance would trouble me first. But she was, she was concerned over what he had said. The word translated troubled in the ESV has more of a sense of being perplexed or being confused rather than troubled. She's confused by what's happening. I don't know if any of us can think back to our teenage years. That was a long time ago. Seeing an angel, first of all, would be troubling. And then being told, listen, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary was confused because she was this small town girl, well removed from the seat of authority in Jerusalem well removed from the temple. But the angel comes directly from God to tell her that she's a favored one and the Lord is with her. Favored one is a compound word with charis, with grace at the heart of it. Favored is grace. God had shown Mary special, specific grace. Why would a backwoods virgin receive special grace from God? That was the significant question in Mary's mind. Here I am, 
I'm from the far reaches of the, of the nation. Put it in our context today. She's from Immokalee. You know, no, nothing really good happens there except agriculture. Why would this girl from Immokalee be seen by God with special grace? That's the question that she was asking. The special grace Mary received didn't change Mary. It didn't make her divine. It didn't make her a perpetual virgin as the, as the Catholics believe. She was not selected by God to, do, to, to be something special. She was selected by God to do something special. That special event, of course, is what we call Christmas. Giving birth to, to the hypostatic union of God-man. That was her mission. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Don't be afraid, Mary. You have grace from God. Charis. Or in, in this case, Karen, which is a, a verbal form of the word charis. Grace. Mary didn't earn that gift from God. He, he didn't say, you've been a really good girl, so we're going to give you this gift. Grace is unmerited favor. God had prepared her, this, prepared her for this to demonstrate in and through her. She was being set up to be a demonstration that we would remember for a long, long time. And behold, you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Mary, the special grace you're going to get is a baby. Now we got problems. Every young girl in Israel wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. You know, every young girl in America wants to be a princess. Right? Every young girl in Israel wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was coming. Please, Lord, let it be me to be the mother, would be their cry. Knew when, no one knew when the Messiah would come, but every girl dreamt of being Messiah's mom. She just heard it was going to be her. Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You're going to be Messiah's mom. Imagine that at 15, 16, 17 years old. What would that do to your mind? Mary knew that Gabriel was speaking of the Messiah because Gabriel told her she would call his name Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation. You're going to have the salvation of Israel. The baby you bear will be the one that brings salvation to Israel. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Those are words that could not make sense to her. Because she didn't yet comprehend what was coming. Gabriel lists several ways Mary's son will be unique. Those are things that the prophet Isaiah said several hundred years earlier. He will be known as the Son of the Most High God. This is a name that means more to the early readers than it does to us. Son, in our context, in our understanding, is somebody that comes from, a descendant of, that is a child of. The word son, in our context, always makes us think of a descendant, a male descendant of parents. Of course, there's other ways that the word can be used, but primarily it speaks of legal or genetical link of a male descendant. That's not how it's used most of the time in Scripture. And it's not the way that it was used by Dr. Luke in, in his writing of this book. Son was not as much a descendant issue as it was a representative issue. The son was the declared heir apparent. The one who would speak for the father and represent him to the world. Jesus is not a descendant from God. He is very God himself. He's 100% God. He didn't stop being God. But the position of son of God is to be seen as the representative of God, empowered by God to carry on God's plan. So you have three uniquely different beings or persons in the triune Godhead. One God, 
Three unique persons in the Godhead. Not three gods. Not three gods in a tribunal. One God in a different function as persons. God the Father, co-equal with God the Son, but God the Son made himself subservient to the Father for the purpose of carrying out the Father's plan. That's the Son of God. And Mary would have understood Son in the context of the representative of God, not his, not his genetic descendant, but his representative, the one that is, is able to speak for God. We should see Jesus as fully God, who is co-equal with the Father, co-eternal with the Father, who volunteered to be put in the position of Son, subservient to the Father. Jesus will also inherit the throne of his human father, David, considered to be the greatest king in, in Israel's history. David brought a relative peace for his son Solomon to reign in. He battled the enemies of Israel and prevailed. He ruled justly and with compassion. Israel understood that there would be a Messiah who would be a descendant, who would be from Judah, a descendant of David, and as we read in our reading this morning, a descendant of Ruth. Not only will he receive the throne of David, but his kingdom will be everlasting. It will be eternal. Now just do a little thought experiment with me. Close your eyes for a moment and try to put yourself in Mary's shoes. You're 15, 16 years old in the backwoods of, of Israel. Rome is pressing down the desire for a Messiah to come and an angel stands in front of you and says, look Mary, you're going to be mom of, of Messiah. It's going to be you. I can't imagine what that thought was like. I can't imagine what her life was like. Your stomach turns. You're confused. You know, I get confused pretty good still. I can't imagine what it would be like as a teenager. All of a sudden, an angel appears and tells you, you've got special grace from God, and even while you're a virgin, you're going to give birth to this miracle baby. I don't think I have the capacity to understand how I'd, how I'd respond to that. I don't, I don't think I can imagine that. I suspect Mary was in kind of the same position. It was impossible to comprehend of the totality of the situation she was just told she was in. How could she be in this situation? And Mary said to the angel, how will this be I'm, since I'm still a virgin? See, miracle is not something we disavow. We all believe miracles will happen. We don't believe they'll happen to us. Right? That's something that happens to other people. That's something that happens other places of the world. And there was Mary being told a miracle is going to happen to you. It was that way for Zechariah. How is this possible? You know, that would be a legitimate case for him to say, my wife is an old lady. We should never call our wives old lady, by the way. Husbands, if you do that, let me smack you now. I hate that phrase, but that would have been a legitimate case, right? Because she was an old lady. But she was going to have a baby. Not an immaculate conception. Natural means. But well past the years of, of childbirth. How could it be true? And there was Mary. How could it be true? I'm still a virgin. How could it possibly be true? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You think what Gabriel said, or what Gabriel said before was big? <laughs> this is way bigger. The baby you're going to have will be the product of the Most High God. You are going to give birth to God. Here's the problem. That sounds to me like it's something that is contrary to what she would have learned in the synagogue. I can't give birth to God. He's, he's God. He's the timeless one. He's the self-sufficient one. He's outside of time and space. How is it possible for me to give birth to God? Your baby will be both God and man, Gabriel tells her. 
Something that's never happened before and will never happen again. I don't know how it happened. I don't know what the Holy Spirit did to cause Mary to be pregnant other than God has the power to do that. He created ex nihilo. Out of nothing he created the world. He can make a baby grow without a dad involved. I would argue that this is a special act of creation by God because a baby growing needs DNA from mom and from dad. So DNA had to be supplied. It couldn't just be Mary's. It had to come from somewhere, and I would argue that it was a special act of God's creation. So the Holy Spirit supplied the male DNA from the special creation, and Mary's body provided the women's DNA. The resulting growing baby was both human and divine, not 50-50, as we would argue, because he's one being, so he could only be 50% man and 50% God. No, he's 100% of both. That's the doctrine of the hypostatic union. How does that happen? I don't know. I can't argue that from a scientific standpoint. I, I don't know how that works. But I can't argue from a biblical standpoint, he's 100% God and he's 100% human. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. As a way of offering proof to Mary, Gabriel says, and your cousin, or your relative, we believe cousin, Elizabeth, remember, she's the old lady living close to Jerusalem. She's about to have a baby. Gabriel tells Mary that Elizabeth has also conceived a son and is already in the sixth month of pregnancy. We learned last week she hid it for five months. So maybe the word was just going out. <coughs> Even though she was barren, she's now going to have a baby. An impossible situation of being old and barren was taken care of by God and Elizabeth was about to have a baby. That would serve as proof that God can do miracles for nothing is impossible with God. So here's your second question. What's the principle from the text so far? What principles do we have here? I think you just said nothing is impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. That's the obvious principle, right? God can and do uh, miracles. Can and does do miracles. Most of us believe that he doesn't do them with us. You know, we, we don't see a lot of miracles happening for each of us, right? I think that's probably not true, but... Both Zechariah and, and Mary were presented with impossible situations, yet they both listened to the word from God through the angel Gabriel. They couldn't rationalize how it could be true, and they even voiced doubt, but they both did what God told them to do. The principle is, even when it seems impossible, just commit to God's plan, because he'll do it. That's the point of the passage. God is going to do the impossible. We need to be prepared for him to work and stand ready to be used by him. Here's a 15-year-old in the backwoods of, of Israel being said, being told, listen, you're going to be the mom of, of Messiah. Okay, I don't understand how this is going to happen, but let's go, God. And she buckled up, put her seatbelt on, and went. Luke says in verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. There's nothing in God's plan that God can't do. There are things God can't do. You know, we always hear this, that there's nothing God can't do. Well, that's not true. There are things he can't do. He can't make a married bachelor. It's a logical impossibility, right? He can't violate his own character. He can't sin. He can't lie. There's things God can't do. But if it's in God's plan, he can do it. And he will do it. He'll do the impossible for us, for our rationale. He'll do the impossible. Was it impossible to God for, for him to make out of nothing everything? No. Clearly it was possible because here we are. Was it impossible for God to cause Mary to be pregnant while still a virgin? No, because she, he did. There are logical fallacies that God can't do, but God can do anything that is in his plan. 
The angel Gabriel told Mary that she was going to have a baby despite being a virgin. He told her that the baby would be God through the power of the Holy Spirit. 2,000 years later, I still can't rationalize that. I don't think anybody can really. Those are impossible things, but not for God. How could she believe it? How is it possible that she believed it as a young teenager? It's possible because Mary said, Behold, I'm the slave, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I love her willingness. I love the faith that she had. Mary said, look, I'm your slave. That's, that's the right interpretation. And rather than servant, read slave. That's, the word, that's a form of the word doulos. I'm a slave of God. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. A teenage girl was told she would have a baby who was both God and man. A baby who was the Messiah. Impossible! But she believed Gabriel and said, let's go God. Let's do this. Both Mary and Zechariah demonstrated the proper response to God's plan. The impossible plan! Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. How could they have a baby? Mary was young, not yet married, not yet having intercourse. How could she have a baby? It was impossible, but not by God's plan. We need to accept the position that we are God's slaves, and he can do what he wants to do through us and in us. Mary was in the most inconvenient position of a young girl could be in, in 2,000 years ago in, in uh, Israel. She was engaged to be married, but not yet married. Remember the process. The arrangement of the wedding would happen. The arrangement of the marriage would happen. And then the groom would go away and build a house. And then when the house was ready, he'd come and get her. So she's engaged, but not yet married. And then all of a sudden she becomes pregnant. We'll look more at this in, in the next coming weeks, but there's a bad situation for her. She would be thrown out by her father's house. She would be thrown out by the community. She would have no support. Most often, women like that turn to be prostitutes because that's all they could do to make a living. Who would ever believe that she was still a virgin? Nobody would. Because it's an impossible thing. Except for God. And yet she stood there and responded, look, I'm your slave. Do what you want to do. Do it the way you want to have your plan. I'm following your plan, God. Even though she couldn't understand how it would happen, she trusted Gabriel and therefore she trusted God to do the impossible. Gabriel said she had received special grace from God to be chosen by God to be put in this position. Well, that makes you think about what you're chosen by God to be in. The position you're in is where God wants you. Now, he may move you from that, but he wanted you there now. So why? Who does he want you to engage with? Who does he want you to talk to? Or as Dell put it, shovel their snow. Or take their pig home. You get the point. I can't imagine what was going through her mind. I suspect that Gabriel leaves and she's sitting there trying to comprehend and then bang in her mind pops up Joseph how am I going to explain this because he ain't going to believe it what fiance would what would the relatives think what was her world going to be like now yet she was willing to sacrifice her own position in society and her own position in her family to do what God had commanded her to do, even when it seemed impossible. I am in so much trouble now, even though I'm following God. So how about you? Are you, are you willing to do that? Or is your focus on yourself and, and what you get? You, focus on you. Or are you willing to stand in the gap where God has put you to be what God wants you to be? regardless of what happens to you. She was theoretically giving up her entire life to be the mother of the Messiah. 
to be ostracized by society, to be even put out of her family because God said so. Are you willing to be used by God by surrendering everything to Him? Mary surrendered her entire life to God to do God, what God called her to do. The impossible. What are we willing to sacrifice? Trusting God to do what He said He would do is a sure bet. He will always do what He promises that He will do. We just need to depend on Him and let Him do it. We're truly His slaves. We need to serve Him like that's true. And like we really believe that what He's told us is true. That there is a correspondence between reality and or what we see and what's true. Because there is. Father, thank you for allowing us to see who you are. Thank you for allowing us to know just a little bit more about what you want us to know about you. Father, thank you for the picture of Mary being willing to sacrifice everything to serve you, to honor you, to glorify you, to bring to you what you called her to do, to have faith in you, to trust you, Lord, that we would have such faith, that we would trust God, to know that you have put us in this, these positions to be your slaves. Give us the opportunities that we, that we seek. Give us the courage that we need. Give us the truth to share. Thank you, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.